In this episode of Guider Talks, Robert talks to Paul Barnes. Paul is founder and managing director of MAP, the UK's leading accountancy firm and outsourced finance function exclusively for digital creative agencies. Hello and welcome to uh, the Guider Grow Your Digital Agency Initiatives uh, podcast. I'm absolutely delighted today to have uh, Paul Barnes with me. Paul Barnes is an accountant. He runs my accountancy place or my accountancy practice. I always get confused because I call it MAP, but he, he runs accountancy practice in Manchester focusing I think pretty much exclusively on on agencies so welcome to you Paul. Thank you Robert thank you for having me today. Great uh, and t- t- tell us um, tell us more about uh, tell us more about yourself tell us more about the accounting practice. Yeah so just to be clear it is MAP we are six years old we've tried to shake off the old my accountancy place brand because we felt it was a bit junior and a bit childish but not done ourselves any favors by only abbreviating it to map so uh, yeah so, so we're map uh, six years in uh, running the accounts firm i also run a technology business called go proposal so go proposal provides uh, it's a SaaS business and it provides a pricing and proposal solution for accountancy firms only we've got 700 accountants in 15 different countries that that license our product offers so i've got a, a SaaS business and an accountancy firm the accountancy firm works exclusively exclusively for digital creative agencies in the uk we've got about 140 clients on our books and we've got 22 staff and and uh, tell me how did you how did you get to where you are now and were you, was it a standard accountancy type piece or and you saw the light because i think everyone knows and i think you know that i'm I'm highly cynical. I bet some people are really quite surprised that I'm interviewing and and by definition supporting uh, an accountancy practice. Unless maybe what I'm going to do is just totally roast you and get a crucifix out and put fire underneath it and burn. I spend a lot of my time roasting accountants, so I'm more than happy <laughs> for that. Um, so yes, yeah, so the backstory is I graduated from university in 2008 with first class honours in accounting and finance, and then nobody would employ me. Uh, one because it was the height of the recession a lot of the graduate schemes were uh, stopping their intake Uh, but number two because I probably wouldn't have hired me I came out of university with great qualifications but I didn't have a clue where to start in terms of putting a set of accounts together and advising small businesses Uh, I eventually got my break down in Cambridge so I packed my car on a Saturday found a flat Saturday evening started a job on the Monday uh, I was always trying to get back up to the northwest. I worked for a fantastic chartered accountancy practice down there who were very, very good to me, considering I spent most of my time there at college and they invested a lot of money in me and didn't want anything back when I left, which was very kind, very generous to them. I'll always remember them for that. Um, I then went to work for two more accountancy firms in the northwest, got qualified, got my practice certificate, and just felt very underwhelmed, Robert, really, just very. Um, lackluster about the way that accountancy firms were run um, we would have the last firm I worked at we would literally have walk-in trade so we had a, a shop front uh, you could see everything we were doing and people would walk in so you'd get potential businesses walk in and it was just too easy to win business we signed 800 clients in five years um, but it, it, it wasn't fun it was too easy we were able to be too complacent Every now and again, you get a really decent quality business that came through the door and you would really have the tenacity, the desire to give them value, to help them with the skills that you've learned. Uh, but you were kidding yourself. You just, you weren't, you had 799 other sets of accounts, payrolls and fact returns to, to prepare and get out the doors. So it was very much a workshop mentality and not very rewarding. So after uh, a few years there, um, the owner of the firm sat down with me partnership and I said, I feel like all the stars are aligning for me to do something myself. Um, I have this passion, I have this desire to give more value, to work with less clients and give them more. And to find, I identify this gap between if you're a micro business, you use an arm's length accountancy firm and an outsourced bookkeeper. And if you're a large business, you have an in-house finance function that's driving the the strategy of the business. If you're an in-between business, you're stuck because you need the big business stuff, but it wouldn't make commercial sense to pay for it. So if we could fill that gap in the market, um, 
the way that we were going to do it is is by leveraging cloud accounting technology that meant that although we can't be in our clients businesses every single day we can be in their accounts literally every single day 24 hours anywhere in the world with an internet connection um so, so so that was the initial strategy but i knew that wouldn't be enough this cloud accounting wagon was coming quickly and everybody was going to jump on it and that would not be enough to differentiate us just because we had live access to the numbers doesn't mean we know how to do anything with it how to actually advise these businesses so then my next move was well we need to specialize we need one industry that we can know really well so that when a business owner in that industry comes to see us we've already got a good understanding of what a good that business looks like and the choice with the digital creative industry um, so that's that's how it all started about six and a half years ago as i say fast forward uh to today and we have 140 agencies around the uk that we service through our three pods that we have in the business and those three pods are effectively acts like finance functions with different people operating at different levels yeah so so let me just let me just talk about accountants for a while because <laughs> Because I know you're one of them, and I know, and, I, and I'm sure you go to, um, you know, parties and stuff, and people say, "What do you do?" And you go, oh, "I run a business." And they go, "What do you do?" And you go, "Oh, I, I'm an accountant." And so, so this is my this is my beef about accountants, not about you, but about about accountants. They have access to the heart of the business. They have access to the to the business brain. They have the capacity to add so much to their clients they have the capacity to not just be historic number crunches but to be to to be able to contribute to an understanding of of how and when and where and what the business should be doing in order to grow and yet they are the some of them not all of them are the laziest uh complacentist self-satisfied people that I've met who don't seem to understand that they could be doing so much more to make their clients so much more vibrant. I mean, I, I talked about this on one of the accountancy things on my book, Grow Your Service Firm, and I literally got poison pen letters. All I was saying was, guys, you could up the game and people would love you. I love my accountant. I've always told you this. I love and adore my accountant. I think he's really special. He really helps me grow my business. And without him, I don't know where I'd be. Everyone should be saying that about their accountants, not just saying, oh, he does, she does the account. They do the year end. So, so why is it they've got such a bad name? Um, great book, by the way. So one of the first books I read before I set up my business was Grow Your Service Firm when you were focused on accountants. And I remember it vividly. I was down in, I was down in Birmingham for the day and my wife, Penny, had a, a work day down there. So she was working for the day and I locked myself in a coffee shop and I literally spent Aww. nine till five reading and making notes on your book and building my strategy around your book, which nicely leads into what I'm about to say, which is that I think when you're referring to accountants here and you are giving them a hard time, you're probably referring to uh, people who run an accountancy firm and finance directors because they have no excuse. Like you say, they have everything on the table for them. They have it all laid out, massive opportunity, and they don't exploit it. What I would say is that we can't have that same kind of attack on any accountant because the accounting industry is such a varied field. You know, the hundreds of titles that come under that category. And actually, Sometimes an account's role is not to be entrepreneurial. It is to tick the boxes. It is to make sure that the fundamental data is right and not necessarily to advise. But when you're in an accounts firm, when you're finance director, we don't have that excuse. Yeah, and, my, and, and we've just appointed one of the businesses that I chair. We've just appointed a finance director. And he is, you know, he is there with this huge, great big break to say, you know, you know, shareholders before you spend this money you know i have to point out i have to advise this is what the numbers look like based on what you're recommending this is what's going to happen but at the same time that same person is able to help us with funding he's helped us to understand when's a good time to invest in the business he's able to uh talk to us about the implications of our pricing because as ordinary entrepreneurs who see a great opportunity or see something really interesting we do we're we're poor 
you know i mean one of the things that every board that i go into yeah every board that i go into it's always you guys and girls need finance training you need to get you need to get an accountant or a finance trainer in here because you're running a business you're in charge of millions of, of pounds of revenue you're in charge of people paying their paying their mortgages or not and it is irresponsible to just let the finance person do do the numbers to to not understand what EBITDA is or not understand what return on shareholders funds or, or whatever it is to, 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 to just say oh I'm in an agency and I, I specialize in in coloring in so someone yeah. else can worry about the numbers no no absolutely that that is not a mature way to run a business and there is definitely a pattern when we look at our best and most successful clients they would not thank you for calling them a creative or a technician they're a business owner first and actually to to the to the extreme that some of them almost wish it wasn't an agency that they ran they just want to grow a really good business and they don't really care what industry it's in it just happens to be digital creative but there are another group where they're figuring out as they go along and that's absolutely fine as well but as you say, they can't abdicate the responsibility for the most important part of their business, which is the only reason businesses fail, <laughs> is if they run out of money. So fundamentally, you've got to be, you've got to have enough acumen to be able to understand the numbers and to drive the numbers. Yeah. Okay. So, so agencies was what you saw as as being a sweet spot. Mm. But what what makes? I mean, are agencies the same as? Any other business or is there something something particularly attractive to you? Is there something unique that you see in agencies? What's I'd, say, I'd, I'd say the 80-20 rule. So 80% of it is the same as running a county firm. It's all about return on labour, even if you are um, not pricing based on time, which hopefully you're not. You fundamentally have people delivering the work and you need to make a healthy return on the people that you've got. Um, a lot of the KPIs um, are the same and we're taking our own medicine. You know, we have to fill in timesheets. We have to work out where we're profitable and where we're not within our business. We have to get efficient. We have to be able to um, charge the right price, et cetera, et cetera. Um, where um, the reason I chose agencies within that service industry that I wanted to be able to you know, be 80% the same is that uh, the, the great people to be around, you know, really fun, interesting people to be around, probably the same reason that you moved away from accountants and, and towards digital creative. Um, they understand the importance of having their finances in order and being in control of them and using them to their advantage, but it's n not usually their skill set. So we have this mutual respect where, you know, I love seeing creative work. I love seeing things that uh, digital creative businesses can do. I can't do it myself. Uh, they love and respect what we can do, but they can't do it themselves. So we get this really good um, connection there. And obviously it's, you know, it's a, it's a very fast growing uh, exciting industry and, and great thing to be a part of and great people to be around so in that in that industry uh, there is i mean there, there is so much going on at the moment uh there's you know google was the only gig in town five years ago now there's five or six platforms Five years ago, it was all about performance and everyone was saying that brand was dead. Now people are saying brand is living and performance has been, been overworked. Mm -hmm. SEO died, SEO is coming back. You've mm -hmm. got management consultancy buying marketing consultancies. You've got marketing consultancies buying digital agencies. Mm -hmm. You've got, you've got uh, the death of Google being threatened endlessly by, by government. You've got political, economic, social change. You've got technological change. You've got AI. You've got, I mean, the list of, uh, you've got uh, the, the, you know, the, the native digital consumer. You've got, you've got um, Bangalore where you can get your work done for $5 an hour. You've got Ukraine where you can get it done for 30. There is, so much flux and change, so much ambiguity. What, what do you see as being the biggest, the biggest challenges, the biggest obstacles for people running running agencies? I think you've just named a lot of it. It's the, <laughs> all of it, it can't it, be all of it. It's the it's the volatility of the industry. It's the the overcrowding. Um, it's 
20 years ago, if I said digital creative agency, you'd say, well, what on earth are you talking about? So the business, the, the industry hasn't existed for that long. The iPhone's only been out since early 2000. So as you say, 10 years ago, if you had digital skills, you were in demand. Um, now there's so many people with digital skills that it's nowhere near enough. And you've really got to work harder to stand out and differentiate yourself, but often work harder as you always talk about, just means being more disciplined and just being more true to who you are and being ready to say no to everything else. Because otherwise what happens is that you just become the, the slaves to the, the, the big companies that have really got you by the balls. So all the things you just talked about um, often lead to agencies. They'll have one deal that they've done at some point along the line that they don't quite know how they won but now they're at that mercy of that large client or two and they just don't know how to get out of it because you talk to them about reducing your reliance on one or two big clients. But what are you going to do? Ask that client to stop spending so much money with you. You're not, you have to build around it and build other clients, but that's hard as well because all your team are stuck on that one big client that you don't dare upset. So um, often the problems start right, right in the beginning. You know, many agencies that come to us in year one, they've made really good revenue compared to most startups in the first year and it's because they've got contacts with some big companies that have paid them a lot of money from the start and then that sets the precedence for um for what goes on so yeah the saturation of everything you've just said um big companies in housing freelancer uh, people leaving agencies and setting up their own agencies or freelancing massive um pressure on price which causes a huge commoditization market and if you're not doing something that's um, it's not about being special, I don't think. I think special sometimes sounds like a bit too high reaching because some of our clients, they would admit that the stuff they do isn't necessarily that sexy, that fun, but it makes really good money and they make a real impact for the clients that they serve. So it doesn't have to always be a shiny, exciting thing. It just has to be, you have to find your way, don't you? You have to find your way of doing something because when you have your way, you can hang your hat on it. Your team can deliver to your way your marketing message can be about your way of course the actual end result for your clients is different every time but if you have one way of going about getting to that result then you can start to build on it okay so um the boring stuff the dull boring stuff uh, so i t i talk a lot about in praise of the dull boring stuff because i because not because i think it's boring it's because people think it's boring. But my would, I would argue, you know, I mean, you know, you know there's, there's a question, which is what do the high performing agents do? What do they do differently from the rest? And I think they may or may not be sexy, though you use that word. They may or may not have sexy products and services. I'm not sure that's, that's what, what matters. I think one of, the, one of the big differentiators for me, and I'd kind of like you to just elaborate if you agree, is, is that the they're really good at the dull, boring stuff. They're really good at, at processes, systems, counting, measuring. Not that that, not that that should be bad, because I don't think it is bad. But I mean, is that is that your is that your experience that that high performers are often really good at that stuff? And if it is, what is that that stuff that makes them better than than others. Mm -hmm. Did some work on this recently, actually. So I'm just opening up the document now where we started to identify with some of our biggest clients what their um, what the patterns were, but often it was that they specialized. So this client specialized, these a number of clients specialized in e-commerce development. They would have uh, partner, strong partnerships with um, one or more partners. So Magento and Shopify, for example. What that meant was that two things those partners were able to bring them new business so they would actually directly generate leads as a result of being on the marketplace of these partners they would also run co-events with these partners and, and and create co-content with these partners so that was helping them to generate business it was also helping them to streamline the way that they did the work because the partners would help them to do it you know the shopify the magento you would have a way of using those platforms that made sure your team knew what they were doing you could make passive income from reselling their platforms and hosting uh, on their platforms. You could have a simplified marketing message about what it is that you do. Um, you were able to give valued high level strategy at a premium as opposed to just being an order taker. 
um, these clients had typically typical spend would be 100 to 150 thousand pound a year on their contracts which would equate to something like three to five percent of the turnover so they've not got massive reliance on one or two clients and they would have a service offering offering that encouraged their clients to stay so some sort of retainer that was sold before they even started and what we worked out in our discussion is the purpose of that was not just about maximizing uh the average value per client because sometimes the retainer was not that grand the size of it but it was actually about keeping that client around because if you continue to be the agency partner for that client we know how hard it is to how much harder it is to win a new client than to keep an existing one so if you can keep that existing one rather than constantly shopping around and when their next big project comes up you're the only company that they look to to do it so that was something about the patterns that we saw from a um from that level but uh, you're right um the best clients that we work with have a regular board meeting. They might have a separate management meeting. They will have agendas. Well, what's that they a, what's a mind shot meeting? Management meeting, sorry. Man- yeah, yeah, management. Yeah. yeah, so often in small businesses, it, it becomes very grey, doesn't it, between what is operational and management and what is yeah. a board. Meeting. But if you can have somebody external um, chairing the board meeting to give an external insight, then, yeah. then that's really valuable. Uh, that you're working through the finances and not seeing it as oh, we've got to do the finances bit now, but actually, you know, really want to know where we're making money and where we're losing money. And that thing about just, you know, chasing the rabbit, where are we? Let's find the next problem. Let's find where we can be making more money um, and be excited by finding problems that you can solve as opposed to seeing them as, oh, I'm so hard done to, you know, I've got problems in my business. Where's the next problem so I can get my hands on it and I can, I can work to solve it. Um, and then I think we'll come on to this in a minute, but, but, but the big thing is about managing against a budget. Um, your biggest, your biggest competitor in business is your own company a month ago. That's the one you want to be beating. Nobody else. You know, when, when you come to, um, when you come to hit your grave later down in life, it's not going to be, you're not going to be remembered for or thinking about how much better than your competitors are. You're going to be thinking about what you've achieved for you and what you've achieved for, for your family. And sometimes that sounds a bit cheesy and eventually you start to realize that actually everything else is just noise. What really matters is setting a really good plan that we're going to be proud of and then executing on that plan. And like you say, for some people, that's boring. Working to a plan is boring, um, but that's what the best do in my opinion. Well, I, that's really interesting because the working to a plan thing, I mean, I, you know, we both get this, oh, I can't plan. I can't, I, I think it's a real cop out in terms of uh, avoiding saying, okay, what is, what is possible? What would we like to achieve and what do we need to do to make it happen? Mm. And, and all, all people are ending up doing by doing, by doing that is they're, they're trying to avoid failure by, by not, committing by not committing to 40 percent year on year growth or not committing to yeah. and clients at two thousand pounds a month or not whatever it is yeah and and i kind of get that you know that's i mean it's it's part of the um you know all those all those experiments with kids the kids that do really really well are the ones who are who want to do new stuff and want to try new stuff the kids who do really really badly tend to want to do the same thing again and again. They don't want to step outside their comfort zone. Um, so I, I, I do kind of understand that people might just say, you can't measure what I do because there's only 10 of us and our clients are so random when they come and when they don't come. Um, and, you know, it's not predictable. And yeah, and some of them are right. Like some of them, it isn't predictable because they are at the mercy of the clients. But, so, they're, but they're, they are able to some degree to, con, to control that by being in front of clients, by being available to the clients, by, by, un, by predicting or, or guessing what the client wants next. And Of course, but I think some of them are so tuned into we just wait for the next brief to come through the door that they're not in control. So they don't feel that they can control it. And they've had a history of that's all they've ever done. And they've not... They, they will show up. I really worry when a business owner says to me, we've not had to focus on our own marketing. 
we've not had to worry about our own marketing and it's because they've been handed briefs and now they used to be in handed briefs and the briefs have dried up and guess what we've not done any marketing for the last 12 months now we're in trouble so the reason that they can't plan is because their mind is restricted to um you know the, the phone hasn't rang in a while nobody's needed us we can't plan because we don't know when the phone's going to ring well actually like you said you can because <laughs> you can do your own marketing you can do your own business development plan and you can create a, a business development strategy that puts you in control um, of, of, of the process and you build a pipeline that's so vast that you, you're not reliant on having one or two having to drop because you've got plenty more waiting mm, yeah yeah, yeah, good. I like that. I like that. So, yeah, I mean, let's talk about the devil's spawn, which is um, KPIs, key performance mm. indicators, key predictive indicators, key indicators. Yeah. I, I jokingly call it the devil's spawn because I know that nine out of ten places where I mention KPI, people just throw their eyes to the ceiling. Yeah. They had KPIs when I worked at blah, 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 and it's the worst thing ever. And yeah, I'm a massive fan of KPIs. I, I think that's how you run and you, you, you drive a business. But I, I, I come at it from a, the same but a different angle. I'd be really interested on, on your mm. take on KPIs. Are they a good thing? How many of them? Should they be standard? Uh, how often should you look at them? Should they, I mean, what, what, what should the KPIs be? I mean, just, just go for it on KPIs. Yeah, okay. So there's certain things that uh, are kind of ubiquitous across any agency and you want to know that you're tracking these things and that you are um, hitting certain numbers in these areas. And there are others that are unique to your business model and you have to take some time to figure it out. So for me, the KPIs come from the business planning, you know, what is it we're trying to do and what are the KPIs that fall out of that that we can use to track to make sure to measure to make sure that we're um on track so yeah there's a difference between industry benchmarks everyone wants to talk about things like uh, revenue per head and profit margin as though there's one uh, answer to that whereas in reality if you think about revenue per head eighty thousand pound could be uh bad eighty thousand pound revenue could be not enough for one agency and sixty five thousand pound revenue per head could be really good for another agency and that's because the cost of running the 80,000 pound revenue per head agency might be much higher than the other agency so if their average salary of their team's higher because they've got higher paid people then they need a higher revenue per head if they've got more overheads because of um, the way that they do business development their office space um, whatever else then they need a higher revenue per head so as you've said um, the revenue per head and things like that are kind of like the, the fag packet coffee shop chat. So if you or I were having a conversation with an agency and they weren't going to open up their confidential data, you might say, well, what's your revenue per head? And you might use that to make some guesses as to how their business is performing, but that's not enough. And when you're running a business, you need to be getting far more under the skin than that and working out your own KPIs. Um, that said, we, we, we deliver something called, um, financial operations reports to our clients and that's where every quarter we will uh, lift the, the bonnet on their business and we will look at uh, the following so I'm happy to share these um, slides if it's useful these graphics Robert but we have a uh, profit per fee earner so you work out who are all the people that are driving um, fees within your business and what's the profit per each of those uh, what's the profit per client so, I said, I get, can, I, can I just stop you there? Because I know, I know what the kickback, the kickback question is going to be. So on the first one, yeah, because uh, we did, we did some stats. Uh, we'll talk about benchmarks in a minute, but, but yeah. we did some stats last year, uh, and we're, we're comprising, compiling, uh, doing them this year. And one of them, one of the top ones, I'm delighted to say, unplanned, is revenue per fiona. And I put the revenue per fiona number up, and immediately people say. What's a fee earner? How do you how do you how do you deal with a project director who only maybe sells ten hours of time a week? I mean, what's mm. how do you how do you calculate the pro profit per fee earner? Well, what you do is um, you have targets in the first place. So the targets of the project director would be less than the um, SEO technician 
who spends 80% of his time on chargeable work. So yeah. you have a table that um, works out what the target profit is and what the actual profit is. And uh, it's worked out by coming up with an agreed cost base. It's never going to be exact because the cost base assumes overheads of X, whereas two months later, overheads might be Y. Um, mm -hmm. But you need to come up with one way of measuring it. People can get obsessed about the absolute penny detail of the data, but actually every which way you look at it, it's telling you the same thing, which is that certain people are underperforming, certain people are overperforming. Um, and what that does, Robert, is just, I should have a discussion. It's not black and white as to, right, this person's not performing. They can't work for us anymore. It's actually, this person's not making as much profit. Did we get the target right? Because actually they're doing lots of really good stuff for the business in terms of the way that they're managing people, the business development, whatever. Maybe we don't need as much profit from them because look, we're making it from these other people. So it can make, it, it just opens the discussion. Um, but do it over a quarter so that you've got a large enough sample of data. And then the key there is to make sure you're comparing apples with apples. So you're not switching and changing and moving that you've actually, Absolutely, 100%. whatever the number is where it, it is the same. Yeah. 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 So you see businesses where you meet them on this. So oh, we're not quite got the systems right yet. We're looking at some new technology to help us with this sort of stuff. Right. Okay. And then you'll see them six months later. Oh yeah. We've not got, quite got the technology working yet. We're still looking for some systems help with this stuff and they're not making progress. So I'll often just say, do you know what? Open a spreadsheet, start tracking it and worry about the systems and the automation and everything else later. But don't try and systemize or automate something that you're not even doing manually yet. Get, get doing it. Start building the data. And sometimes you might not even use the data in the early few mm. months because you're just figuring it out. But it, it gives you some comparisons for later. Okay. So profit per fee and was number one. I interrupted you. Back profit, per, profit per client is number two. Um, so all your clients with, 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 with their profit. Someone taught me something really interesting and, and it's true since I've, I've been looking at this more. If you list all your top clients, uh, best to worst, what you'll find is that the, the best clients use up all your time, you over-service them, they've got you in the WhatsApp channel, they've got you in the Slack channel, they've got your mobile number and they're ringing you at weekends, you bow down and do everything to them and they become quite unprofitable. If you look at your worst clients, high maintenance they're not paying you much money but as a proportion of their marketing budget is huge and they're massively reliant on you uh, they're never happy they always want more they want more for free the clients in the middle are the clients where you may, might not be making massive ways for them but actually they're really pleased that they had scope you delivered on it they paid you some money they're grateful and they move on and that those ones that are in the middle if you can build your agency around those type of clients um then that's a really good strategy and actually it's the same for your people so your best people are the ones with the egos always want more and more from you never happy won't pay more your worst ones just need the hands holding all the time always making mistakes but the ones that are in the middle they're just mm -hmm. pleased they're not looking to change the world but they are just looking to do a good job good honest job for their clients give some value and get paid fairly. Um, so I thought, I thought that was really interesting. So when I'm talking about this, but I'm not just talking about average profit per Fiona and average profit per client. I'm talking about literally Fiona by Fiona, client by client, do the average at the bottom by all means, but have a look at the patterns. Because otherwise you say, oh, why is our average so low? Because this person should yeah. be doing a lot more. So um, then your average revenue per client, um, uh, and your client concentration to understand how much you're at the mercy of, of your biggest clients yeah. uh, and your overall recovery rate as well. And what your recovery rate tells you is how much work you are doing for free. So, so, so what is, what is overall recovery rate could you, for everyone? Could you just make that clear? It's your total revenue divided by the time spent on chargeable work. So if you look at the time sheets, the time spent on chargeable work, and you might need to break this down if you've got different bands, but let's assume you haven't and you've got one uh, band. So let's say £85 an hour is what you charge for your services and your recovery rate comes in at 72. That means that you've spent a lot of time, on, I mean, you've spent more time on chargeable work than you've actually charged for. So it's not ended up on an invoice. Got it. Okay. Uh, so, so we look at doing those every quarter and then every month it's the financial KPIs. So this is where you compare against budget. So again, I'll send these out to make it easier. But Great. Re Fantastic. Revenue for the month, operating profit for the month, operating profit margin. The same for year to date, same three numbers for year to date. 
your cash reserves and your uh, debtor days because um, they're the ultimate ultimate drivers of cash. And then the final thing I want to say on KPIs very quickly is just that the, the latest buzz, buzzword seems to go around dashboards. Everyone seems to be obsessing about getting dashboards in the business. Uh, we've actually got some ourselves in Matt, but I believe that we're using them in the right way because um, people want dashboards, they're not really sure what they want them for. So they invest in the technology, invest in Databox or Gecko boards or something like that. Fantastic dashboards and they don't know what to do with them. The data falls behind and no one's using them. For me, a dashboard is the things that you want to have your eye on on a day-to-day basis. And that is actually very few things. So you should not be recording your recovery rate on a day-to-day basis. The amount of admin that goes into that would not make sense to be recording on a day-to-day basis. Nor your profit margins, because you don't know it until the end of the month when everything's properly been accounted for. Uh, nor revenue per head, because everything's not been invoiced yet, et cetera, et cetera. What you should be looking at day-to-day is your revenue, because that's the most volatile number in your business. You've got a reasonable grip, hopefully, on what your overheads are, and you'll find out at the end of the month if you've overspent on anything. But your revenue is the thing where, once you've worked out your overheads and how much profit you want to make, the revenue is the number on top. And you've got all these things in the pipeline, and you want to know how much of it is converting into revenue that's going to help you to achieve your financial plan. So the day-to-day metrics are revenue converted, revenue quoted, and the percentage of extra that you need to convert to hit your target. So if I try and give you an example, yeah, you've, got, you've converted 80,000 this month and your target is 100,000. You've got another 40,000 quoted. So now you need to convert 50% of the 40. And that will give you an idea of have we got enough in the pipeline? Because if you've only got 20 in the pipeline, you need to convert 100%, and that's too high because your conversion rate won't be 100%. And, and do, you, do you use some kind of a weighted pipeline? In other words, they phoned us, so we only have a 5% likelihood that it's going to become a client where versus we've, we've given them a proposal, there's an 80% chance. Is that, is that how you do it, or, or is it just pure, pure proposal I don't, value? I don't really like the weighting because you could have given a proposal for someone you think – that didn't go well. They're not going to sign. Mm-hmm. According to our maths, it tells us that 80% sign, but I know that person's not going to sign. I got a really bad feeling. They're seeing other agencies. They've already made the mind up. So you don't want to be associating 80% of probability to that client that in your mind is 5%. Um, and the alternative, um, the, the other way around also applies. So I, I do believe that, you know, science has its part, but so does human judgment. At some point, you've got to be able to allow your team to apply their judgment as well. So what should go on the quoted really should be things that you've got a reasonable chance of winning. And if you've not, just leave it. Because you've still got your CRM over here. You've still got your pipeline system. Yeah. This this is actual revenue that we think we've got a chance of converting. Yeah. And then you've got to, you've got to divide out what the sales manager says, which is mm. almost yeah. always 50 or 100% above, you know, what is, what is, what is actually going to come in. You know, just because, mm. oh, sorry. We'll talk about mm. sales. We'll talk about sales in another time. Cool. Yep. So uh, I think you've kind of answered my question about benchmarks, which was, which is benchmarks. Love interesting, at, interesting at best. Coffee shop conversation. See, I'm about to, I'm literally about to gather benchmarks from the States, UK, Romania, Poland, right the way across the board. So obviously it becomes a little bit meaningless to compare Poland with mm the states but on the other hand everyone in poland is quite interesting to compare that with romania and so on and so forth uk mm. netherlands and, and so on and so forth and and i you, what you said is is fantastic because everyone is so it's the slide that i put up and everyone gets their phones out and they take pictures of it you know yeah what about all the other stuff i showed you that's actually going to make a difference to your business yeah well that, that's the thing and and also is as you quite rightly said you know one one agency might be trying to grow market share because what they want to do they slowly want to grow their their agency in the north another one is thinking about looking good for sales so they might be screwing everything into profitability and no one's spending any money on anything no more biros do you realize that that biro cost a pound and mm-hmm. with our multiplier of 10 times we're going to get that back um 
Great. I'm really glad you feel like that about them. So this is, this is why your annual budget is such an important process. Again, something that sounds really boring, but I, I, I suggest you should be spending a couple of days a year putting your annual budget together because that's where you would say, um, are, are we going into uh, detail about every single little biro or are we not? So it's at that point you make the decisions on what an acceptable revenue per head, net profit margin, et cetera, et cetera, is going to be. And then you track against what you said you was going to do, not what the competitors are doing, not what the consultants think you should be doing, but you've taken the time at the start of the year to decide what good looks like, measure yourself against that. Brilliant. I love that. I love that. I love that. And what's your, just out of interest, what's your, what's your view on, on multipliers? Because that's the other one I'm always, how much do you think our business is worth? And it's like, well, are you buying or are you selling? Because if you're selling, you think it's <laughs> big, but if you're buying, it's different. Yeah, so I believe it's somewhere between, we've not sold a lot of agencies as of yet. Um, a lot of the clients that we work with, you know, that they're early in the journey in the first 10 years of, of running the business, not all of them, but some that are 20 years plus. Um, but I believe uh, that the multi multipliers have been something like four to eight times um, EBIT um, for an agency. Um, there are a number of variables that affect that. Client concentration is a really big one. Um, Profitability, not not uh, actually in recent conversations I've had with M&A experts hasn't been as important because there is a belief that some of these bigger networks believe that they can quickly add value to the bottom line by streamlining a, what, a, a lot of what agencies are doing, putting in their own systems and processes and really being able to add profit quite quickly. So they want to see a bit of stability with revenue, stability with clients, stability with team, good culture, that kind of thing. And then they're much more likely to swallow you up into their big empire, uh, find efficiencies and, and make it profitable very quickly. Um, there's, a, there's definitely more activity going on in this area now than there has so, been in the so if it's So if it's not about profitability, is it, is it you, you're arguing that you're seeing more multiples of revenue rather than multiples of profits or multiple of um contracted business what's what's the, what are the multiples on yeah i think so I, i'm not sure of it exactly to be honest um but i, I know that the profit has been uh, less of interest to them um i think they want something that's sizable enough to make a difference uh, good people, good culture, etc. But in terms of how they actually value it, yeah, probably. What what they tell me is that it's normally the, the cop out answer is it's sophisticated, and and it's kind of fair enough. It's not. It can't just be based on one number. But like you said, if a larger percentage of the business is contracted revenue, it's going to get a better value. But also, if client retention is better, it's going to get a better value. Um, client concentration, etc. Et so there are a number of things that come into it. Yeah, I, just, I, I, I wonder how how sophisticated it is and whether that isn't just a bit of a, bit of a negotiation mark that people look and they recognise they're going to get their money back in six years. If, 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 if it goes according to plan, four years, if it's better, mm -hmm. that seems good enough. It's better than having the money in the bank. It fits yeah. in strategically. They know that one in four acquisitions is going to do brilliantly. Mm -hmm. so that kind of... yeah mentality to it because I, I i struggle to understand i've got several agencies i've been talking to they're all talking about 10 times 10 times ebitda and i'm just going oh really i i can't see that and then i see people who own agencies who are buying other agencies and they're looking they're looking at buying but they're looking at three or four times ebitda so, mm. so that there's a huge range there's a huge gap i mean it's probably probably a conversation for an entire hour but anyhow we'll, yeah 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 and but but what i would say fine on that is try not to be so obsessed about the value and just be more realistic at the fact that very few businesses ever sell so like what one in ten businesses last 10 years or whatever so imagine what percent that's 10 percent imagine what percentage actually then find a willing buyer to pay you money to take your business off you instead of starting their own. So focus more on building a saleable business as opposed to valuation because just that bit's hard. But what it'll also allow you to do is the same reason that an investor should want your business should be the same reason that you want to run it and Absolutely. enjoy it. And, and, and if you've got a profitable business, in fact, I did a Facebook live thing with Hip Hop the other day that, that, that you should never use 
you should never use uh, break even because break even isn't enough to grow the business. You should, you're, you know, it's like black is the new gray or gray is the new black. You know, break, yeah. The new break even is 10% net profit to, to grow the business. And yeah. um, I, I just, if you are making 10% net profit, you can afford to give someone 50,000 quid a year to run the business and you can bog off and hit golf balls and come back in 10 years time and the business will be 10 times bigger than it was. Why wouldn't you do that than, than go through the pain of trying to sell? And if you're sub 10 million turnover, you're probably not that attractive. And da, 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 da. The point is, if you build a profitable business, it gives you options, doesn't it? Because you yeah, might decide absolutely, to absolutely. sell or keep it, but you're in a position to be able to do that, as opposed to the worst situation is you make a distressed sale because um, yeah. you can't uh, handle the, the, the pressure anymore of a, a business that's struggling along. So you want to sell it to someone who's only ever going to pay a low price to take that off you. Too right, too right. Okay, so just, just starting to... To, to, to wind down, um, I guess my, my question to you is, you know, what would what would your one liner recommendations be? I mean, they can be what I call bromides, which is kind of slightly cliched, or they can be yeah. a bit more a bit more. You know, there's one thing you need to know, or one thing you need to know. Yeah. I'm really interested to know what your kind of one liners are. Yeah, so in my world, from financial world, it is that idea of stop obsessing over benchmarks and put the time into putting your own financial plan together. Everybody talks about putting a plan together, but I'm talking specifically about an annual budget, which sounds like it only means a financial thing, but it's not. It starts getting you thinking about how much we're going to invest in our team, where we're we going to invest in their training, what sort of office space do we need? Um, how are we going to generate new business? What are we going to pay for to do that? Should we invest here or invest there? Um, when you know the numbers that you're trying to achieve the bottom line and you know what a reasonable turnover target to go for is, then you're given an overhead budget. And that's where you set the, the rules of the game in terms of what's a, um, a digestible amount that we can invest in all these different areas that we'd love to invest in, but still gives our bottom line. So, um, uh, we've got a template of putting a budget together if, if you want to share that, but, but whatever we use uh, Google sheets, we just built a template in Google sheets. So use a spreadsheet or whatever, don't get bogged down with technology and put that plan together. But start with, before we get into the detail, of the numbers, what do we want to come out the back of this process? So in two days time, when we're signing off a budget or next week in front of the board, or whatever, what do we want the number to say? Is it that we want, £300,000 profit because we made 250 last year and that would be a good growth. Is it that we want to continue to grow turnover and we're happy to keep the profit number the same, even though that would mean lesser margin? Don't be dictated by other businesses. Be dictated what success looks like for you. Then get into the detail and try and connect the dots back to what you said your goal was for the budget. Um, so that's my, my main bit of advice. And then the other one is just to every... Running any business is so many distractions. There's so many opportunities and so many opportunities seem to make sense, but just because they make sense doesn't mean that you should do them. And even if you should do them, it doesn't mean you should do them now. Um, we recently got the opportunity to sponsor uh, something that I had wanted to sponsor for a long time, but we had to wait for somebody else to pull out for us to sponsor this day. Cause there's going to be loads of agencies there, a big opportunity for us. And they finally, gave us the opportunity to sponsor and we had just signed off our budget a few weeks before for that, for that, for that year. And I said, uh, I am interested, but not this year. Uh, you know, next year we might be able to put this in our budget, but it's not in our budget for this year. And to have that discipline, um, is when at the end of the year, you don't have all these regrets that you've gone and, and you lose confidence of other people when you start spending money and doing things that are different from what you said you're going to do at the start. So have that, have that discipline to, make your own plan and then stick to what you said you were going to do. Um, and be, be excited about, uh, about making the profit and be excited about hitting your numbers. Don't see it as a, a boring part of business. See it as, you know, if everything can be geared towards that, and that is the only way that you and your talent, you and your team can credibly celebrate together because that's when you've actually made money to be able to afford to celebrate You've done the things you said you were going to do. It's not the beanbags and pool tables. It's we said we we're going to achieve this, guys, and we've all achieved it together. You know, well done. We've created some extra money to be able to celebrate, and let's go again next quarter. Brilliant, Paul. That's that's uh, 
that's absolutely fantastic. Um, so uh, we'll put some links at the end so that uh, the materials Paul was talking about uh, you can you can download and look at and yeah, you know, contact Paul, go to his website, uh, check them out. Uh, Paul, uh, thank you so very much for being well, guest today. Uh, been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Very thanks, much. Robert. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Cheers. Okay. Bye. Bye.